Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to this session on course. I'm Mr. McInnes, and uh, I'm glad you all showed up today. And I want to take you through some good uh, thoughts on college readiness, and especially on uh, decision making. And uh, we're going to ask the question today, are you on course? The, the book that we're using for this is called On Course. And uh, uh, if you would like one, we can we can get one for you if you're more interested in some of this stuff. But everything you need to know today is really up here. So we are talking today about decision making. And uh, we're going to, to look at it kind of from a different angle. And uh, I want to impress upon you today something that is very, very important, something that I've learned through the years, and uh, I, I hope you take away with you, and that is this point right here, that ideas have consequences. Ideas have consequences. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that ideas influence behavior. That is, what you believe uh, affects what you do. And so that is very important in this college setting. You need to come into this time of your life thinking the right way. And if you don't think the right way about certain things, then this is a great time to change those ways and start to think correctly about things. There is uh, a cycle of success that if you will allow it to happen, really can start to happen. So what happens in this cycle of success is, first of all, you kind of, oops, okay, first of all, you, we need to, we need to, have some positive beliefs. And when we have those positive beliefs, they automatically <coughs> lead us into effective behaviors, right here. Those effective behaviors, if, if done over and over, will lead us to success, or I should say, success is. They will lead us to, to uh, having success in different parts of our life and in our classes. And when that happens, a funny thing happens. I said it was a cycle. Well, that's exactly right. These successes that you have will then reinforce those positive beliefs that started the whole thing. And it's just, it's a really good cycle. You've heard of a vicious cycle. Well, this is not. This is a, a beneficial, happy cycle that happens in our lives when we start to uh, have those right beliefs. And so a lot of what we're talking about today is going to focus on that. Anybody know what those are? What kind of shoes are those? What, what? Golf shoes. Golf, you would think golf shoes. Anybody else? Tap. They're not. Tap shoes? No, they're not tap shoes. Runners. That's it. These are running shoes. You see those nails sticking out the bottom of them there? Those are, uh, but this is what it looked like when Mr. Royce was uh, a young man. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a story for you from 1954. Um, there is a, a man named Roger Bannister that on May 6, 1954, did something that no one had done before. Up until Roger Bannister's time, there was a, a firm belief that you could not, that, that no one could break the four-minute mile. And Roger Bannister did it and something happened. We'll, we'll, let's, let's watch him do it, and then we'll talk about what happened after that. Introducing Hooked on Tuesday at Little Fish Grill. Bring a three-course Tuesday menu with your we'll, we'll let that pass, and then we'll get to our actual video. May the 6th, 1954, Roger Bannister, a 25-year-old medical student, shook the world by breaking what had seemed an insurmountable athletic barrier. At least that's what many experts claimed as Bannister, paced by two fellow graduates, set off to try to break the four-minute mile. Over the years, the target had become an elusive obsession for all middle distance runners. The nearest anyone had come to it was 4 minutes 1.3 seconds by the great Swedish athlete Gunga Haag, and that was nine years earlier. Christopher Chatterway took over the pace after Chris Brasher had done his bit in the early stages.
The weather at Oxford University's athletic track hadn't looked too promising. The cold wind was blowing just before the start. By the time Bannister had begun his final 300 yards, the wind had dropped. It was now make or break for the finishing line. Bannister had run the last lap in 59.4 seconds, and it was more than enough to give him the record. 3 minutes, 59.4 seconds. No one had beaten the 4-minute barrier before. It was a great performance, and done in the days of cinder tracks, spikes and training bouts between studies. Guts and grit in true amateur spirit. Guts and grit. So maybe more than a physical barrier, it was more of a mental barrier, right? Because everybody had thought, we can't do this. We can't get past this four minute uh, mile marker. Uh, but then Roger Bannister did it. And what do you think happened after that? Others did it. Others did it, that's right. Uh, in fact, the record today is three minutes, 43 seconds. So. Uh, that that's a lot quicker. I mean, you know, and and uh, you think about how fast that really is. But yeah, that's what happened. Um, people started thinking differently, and it affected their behavior. Ideas have consequences. Ideas influence behavior. And it's the same thing with you sitting here in this class and in your other classes, and when you go out into the workplace as well. Now, a lot of people think that this is what college is all about, and true. Uh, we do need to learn the skills. If you are a nursing major, you need to know where to stick the needle, right? I hope. If you are an engineering major, I hope that you figure out how to build roads because I don't want to fall you know, in a hole as I'm driving. Uh, whatever it may be, you know, I, there are certain skills that, that teachers have to learn to be able to convey what we're trying to get across. But this is not the whole picture when it comes to college. There's also uh, something uh, else and we'll call the the difference between the two uh, ways of thinking soft skills and hard skills and we want to do this we want to develop the right combination those skills that we mentioned like uh, putting a needle in or learning how to build a road those are called hard skills soft skills are something else let's look at hard skills here's a definition these are, this is the technical knowledge needed to perform in a particular occupation. So for instance, a mechanic must know his wrenches and their uses. It's very important. We have to know that stuff. But it's not enough. You can't just have hard skills and do well in life. You have to have soft skills too, which are intangible personal attributes needed in order to be successful in all areas of life. So what does that mean? I didn't give you an example because this is a little harder to nail down. I will give you some, but not yet. It's been said that having hard skills can get you hired. When you go to that job interview and you, and you know your stuff, yeah, that's going to get you hired. But lacking soft skills can get you fired. That's happened many a time. There needs to be a good combination. Where the, where the hard skills can't do something for you, the soft skills have to. Where the soft skills, you know, it, 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 you can have all the soft skills in the world, and we'll talk about what those are, but if you can't do the job, then, then you can't do the job. So if we've got to have both. It's got to be a combination. So what are we talking about here? What are soft skills? All right, so I, I did a poll at the beginning for some of y'all who were here um, about what you ate for breakfast. That was just a fun one. But I'm going to do a poll now, and I want everybody to get out your device. I know we all have our phones or whatever. Okay, that's all right. Uh, and uh, and you guys in the back can do it too. I'm going to go to our, uh, I want to get out of here just for a second and go to um, another poll. And here it is, and let me make it big, and we'll toggle full screen. And you can either Text your answer, and you want to text to 22333, and when you do that, you want to put in 254181, and then write your answer, what you think a soft skill would be, and then, or you can tweet it if you are into Twitter, and you can do at poll space 20, or 245181, and then 
put in your message there. Either way, we'll bring it up. So let's see what we get. What do you think are soft skills? Okay, that's good. Organizational skills. Time management. You know what? Let me change the way this looks so we can. Sometimes this cloud uh, thing gives us a little trouble of being able to figure this out. So, all right, time management, organizational skills. Y'all working on it? Get it in there. So far, you're all right. Everybody's right. Another minute or two here to get it all in. Is it working? Is it, has anybody pushed send or whatever and, it, and it's not gone? Oh, there's another one. Customer service, integrity. You're all on target. You know what you're talking about. Have you had soft skills? Uh, vote, have you had that word before show up in your, in your okay, you're getting it, you're getting it. All right, does anybody else want to do one before I go back to the PowerPoint? Okay. Sometimes these are things that we say, you know. We're still working on my hard skills, right? Now. Okay. <laughs> you, you can't learn these things in class. These are, this is on the job type stuff. <laughs> Willingness, to, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Determination. All these are wonderful. Y'all are hitting the nail on the head. All right, well, let's go back and talk some more. This gives some of them. When you think about uh, soft and hard skills, I'll get back in the camera here. When okay. you think about soft and hard skills, soft skills really are, you know, there's a bunch of them. Here are some, and you may have named some of these, but empathy, you know, having a, have caring for others, uh, coaching and mentoring, both being a, being a mentor and uh, having someone mentor you, personality development, motivation, Negotiations, working with others. Time management, I saw Marsha outside making herself a note in her planner, and I see it's got a bunch of highlighter in it. That's wonderful, that's great soft skills. Creativity, communication, all those are soft skills that we need. You can't get by without those things. So, our book, our uh, on-course book here, actually goes through uh, several soft skills, eight of them to be exact, and that's what this book is. And over the, the next few uh, sessions, we're gonna have four, or two this semester and then two next semester, we're going to be tackling these soft skills that are, that are in this book. So I titled this, Success or Struggle, You Choose. You can be a successful student or you can be a struggling student, and it's really all up to you. It's not up to anybody else, and that is we're going to talk about that big time later on. So let's go through and talk about eight different soft skills that, that if you master these, you will be a successful student. And it gives the other side too, what you don't want to do. So here's number one, and we're going to come back to this one later. The first one is that successful students accept personal responsibility, seeing themselves as the primary cause of their outcomes and experiences. But struggling students, and you've all met these people, and I hope you're not one of these, or if you are, you're gonna change, see themselves as victims. Maybe what happens to them is determined primarily by external forces such as fate, luck, and powerful others. We're gonna talk a lot about that. This is our, our goal for the day. But another one, a second successful soft skill is discover self-motivation, finding purpose in their lives by discovering personally meaningful goals and dreams. Struggling students, on the other hand, have difficulty sustaining motivation, often feeling depressed, frustrated, and or resentful about a lack of direction in their lives. And we'll focus on that and, and some other things in our next one in October. But what motivates you? Is it from inside somewhere, or is it some other force that you don't really, you're not really feeling? 
A third one is that successful students master self-management. Good job, Marcia. I'm sure the rest of you do that too. Consistently planning and taking purposeful actions in pursuit of their goals and dreams. But on the other hand, struggling students seldom identify spe uh, specific actions needed to accomplish a desired outcome. And when they do, they tend to, that big word, we don't like that word, we all do it, don't we? Procrastinate, yeah. So self-management, have that calendar. A fourth, successful students employ interdependence, building mutually supportive relationships that help them achieve their goals and dreams while helping others do the same. But on the other hand, many students are solitary, seldom requesting and even rejecting offers of assistance from those who could help. This is the one where first day of class, you need to get somebody's phone number. You need to make contact if you haven't already. You can do that in a non-creepy way. You know, you can say, uh, you know, where, where it doesn't seem like you're asking someone out of date. But finding out, uh, uh, finding others who can help you and that you can help. This is good stuff. Number five is that successful students gain self-awareness, consciously employing behaviors, beliefs, and attitudes that keep them off course, whereas struggling students make important choices unconsciously, being directed by self-sabotaging habits and outdated life scripts. Listen, you're doing that today. You being here is gaining self-awareness. You are helping yourself right now by finding out where you're weak and thinking about where you can be stronger. Uh, that outdated life scripts, we'll get to this one, but have you ever met somebody uh, who wants to be a physical therapist or a pharmacist, but they hate math and they hate science and chemistry? Uh, they made that life script when they were a young person and they thought, oh, that looks like fun. But then, now that they're, they're, they're older, they, um, they're, they find that their academic interest lies somewhere else, but they're still hanging on to that outdated life script. Our sixth one is successful students adopt lifelong learning, finding valuable lessons and wisdom in nearly every experience they have, rather than resisting learning new ideas and skills, viewing learning as fe fearful or boring, rather than as mental play. I've been uh, teaching for a long time and doing other things for a long time, and I'm still having to learn. I, I, there are people in here who are too, who, it never ends. If you're going to be a success, you're going to have to embrace the idea that you're not just going to learn it and then it's done. You're going to learn it, and then you're going to learn a new way to do it, and then you're going to learn new, uh, new developments in the field that you're in. Uh, and you're also going to see every experience in life as a way to learn and not, not just uh, reject that. Our seventh one is that successful students develop emotional intelligence, effectively managing their emotions in support of their goals and dreams. Whereas struggling students live at the mercy of strong emotions such as anger, depression, anxiety, or a need for instant gratification. You don't have to be in college long to meet the person on the right. There are lots of people who are living by their emotions, whatever they may be negative or positive, but you can't do that. You have, to, you have to know yourself emotionally. And the last one, number eight, is that successful students believe in themselves, and they see themselves as capable, lovable, and unconditionally worthy human beings. Struggling students doubt their confidence and personal value, feeling inadequate to create their desired outcomes and experiences. One of the biggest things that people do here on this side is self-comparison, and we'll talk more about that too. Is, is looking at other people and saying, I'm not as good as them, and thinking that it immediately dooms you to, to uh, struggle or to not have success. But uh, we need to believe in ourselves that we can do this, and you can. You can, you, you've made it this far. Why can't you go further? Why can't you do another day of college? Why can't you finish your degree? There's no reason at all, but you need to believe it. Belief, beliefs have consequences. Ideas have consequences. All right, well, let's move on. I want you to remember what I just said. Ideas have consequences. That ideas influence behavior. Get this in your mind, okay? Think about it. Make it part of who you are. And that what you believe influences what you do. So you've got to get your beliefs right before you get your doing right. Your behavior is not going to come out of, good behavior is not going to come out of bad thoughts and bad beliefs. So let's go back and delve into this one. 
This was our first one that we looked at. Per successful students accept personal responsibility, seeing themselves as the primary cause of their outcomes and experiences, rather than seeing themselves as victims, that everything happens to them. What is personal responsibility? This is a great definition for it. The essence of personal responsibility is responding wisely to life's opportunities and challenges rather than waiting passively for luck or other people to make the choices for us. So, responding. Respond. If I look at that and I think, okay, what's the word that I need to, to hone in on? It is responding. It's not just sitting there doing nothing. That's what victims do. So let me ask you a question. Are you, you don't have to answer this, we're not gonna do a poll on it, but are you a victim or a creator? A victim or a creator? What do we mean by that? Have you ever heard someone say, my teacher gave me an F? Now I know none of you have said these things that I'm about to bring up, all right? My teacher gave me an F, have you heard that? Okay, what about, I don't have my assignment because my printer ran out of ink. Mm -hmm. Or I missed class all last week because my car was in the shop. I failed the test because the teacher didn't give us a study guide. I didn't turn in my homework because I was absent the day before. All of those sound like excuses to me. I'm a teacher, you know, but all of those sound like excuses, not owning the problem. So if you've heard these, then you have heard victim language. All right, so let's go back a minute. All that is victim language. My teacher gave me an F, not I earned an F. Or my, I don't have my assignment because my printer ran out, of, ran out of ink, not I have my assignment because my printer ran out of ink, but I went to the library and printed it out instead. It's about being resourceful. So let's talk about victims and creators. Victims, here's the definition, keep doing the same things even when they don't work. You know what, that's also, I've heard many times, the definition of what? Insanity. Insanity, right? So victims keep doing the same things even when they don't work. Listen, we all do this. I'm gonna show you some things. We're gonna go through some things and I bet you will find yourself, I bet it was a little ouch, you know, I was reading, I was like, oh, I kinda do that sometimes. But we want to strive toward this, where we're not afraid to change our ideas and actions to create results. If the printer runs out of ink, you go to the library early. You wake up early, you get it done. You're resourceful. Um, you know, that's what, that's what creators do. That's what successful people do. They don't whine and complain. Victims see themselves like this little guy. Any chess players in here? Okay, what's that piece? A pawn. a pawn, that's right. Victims see themselves as pawns, that things just happen to them. A pawn can't move, uh, and let, well, none of the pieces really can, but the pawn, you know, we think about that, that person, that, that piece can't move unless somebody else is doing the moving. And that's how they see their whole lives. Let's talk about a couple of different ways that you can look at things. And then we'll call this the responsibility model. And of course, I'm getting all this. This is from our on-course book. I'm not making this stuff up. But this is a responsibility model. Let's say that you have a stimulus. My printer runs out of ink. My car goes in the shop, okay? That's your stimulus. That stimulus then is gonna lead us to make a choice. And we've got two choices in every situation. We can be a victim or we can be a creator. <coughs> If you're a victim, then your response is gonna be blaming, complaining, excusing, and repeating certain behaviors. So my printer ran out of ink, I'm gonna blame it on the printer. It's the printer's fault, oops, not my fault. But what happens as a result of that response? The result is that it seldom achieves goals. You made an F on an assignment, or whatever the teacher gave you. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, as good as it could have could have been. But on the other hand, if you choose to be a creator, and it is this, it really is, you make the choice every time. And it's hard. This is an easy choice, but it leads to bad places. 
this is a good choice, but it leads to good places. And that's really all of life. You know, if you've lived any amount of time at all, you know that the hard, the hard road is usually the better road. But anyway, as a creator, your response then is to seek solutions, to be resourceful, to take action, to try something new. And the result oftentimes is that goals are achieved. So let's look at some victim language versus creator language. Let's, let's actually look and give some examples of what we're talking about here. First, victims focus on their weaknesses while creators focus on how to improve. All right, here's an example of a victim focusing on his or her weakness. I'm terrible in whatever, math, English. I can't write an essay. That's focusing on your weakness. But what would a creator do? Well, he or she would say, you know what, I find this course challenging, so I'm gonna work extra hard. I'm gonna seek out help. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. I'm not just gonna lie down and die. I'm gonna keep moving. So creators focus on how can I improve in this situation. Victims, secondly, make excuses for everything. My car was in the shop, so I couldn't make it to class. Or, or um, the instructor is so boring that he puts me to sleep. Creators, on the other hand, seek solutions. Let's use the old car in the shop one. I hear that one sometimes. What does a creator do when the car is in the shop? Walk to school. Walk to school. <laughs> Thumb it, right? Hit, hit your ride. What'd you say? Finds another car. Finds another car, calls a friend, whatever it takes, because going to class is important. And so, you know, this person is going to, but that person, and, and I'll tell you what, in a college class, too, if, a te if, if you tell a teacher that or a teacher knows that you fall hard to get there, don't you think that's going to go far? I know, I'm, I'm, I'm an instructor here. That's going to go far in my thinking about you. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt next time. And that happens in the workplace, too. Victims complain, whereas creators turn complaints into requests. If you, anybody plan on being an educator? Anybody going to the teaching field? Well, it's this way everywhere. But I'll tell you, sometimes the teacher's lounge is the worst place on campus because it's nothing but this right here. And it brings morale down. It's, it's not a good situation. You don't want to hear people talking about how bad it is all the time. You want people to turn those complaints, the, those inner complaints, into requests. How can I make it better? You know, don't just lay down and die and complain. Think about how can I make it better? So um, if you, uh, just an example from class, you know, a, a complainer might say, this course is, is a stupid requirement. I don't see why I have to take this. Uh, but a creator, on the other hand, would say, you know, I don't understand why I have to take this course, but I'm going to ask my instructor to help me. I'm going to, I'm going to find out some benefits of this course. And, and it's really just having a positive attitude. Here's a good quote for you. I can come up. There we go. You all know this lady, Maya Angelou. This was some advice given to her by her grandmother. She said, to her, her grandmother said, what you're supposed to do when you don't like a thing is change it. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. Don't complain. What is it, you know, when you change the way you think about something, what is that called? Anybody? That's your, your attitude about something. And attitude is everything, as you've heard many times, I'm sure. If you can't change the thing itself, which many times we can't, um, change the way you think about it. Don't complain. Another victim versus creator language is victims compare themselves unfavorably to others. I've talked about this a little bit. This is something that I fall prey to, and I bet that if you were honest, many of you have done the same thing. You know, John is, he's so smart, you know, I'll never match up to his skill in whatever it is. Um, but the creator goes to that person and says, you know what, you're really good at this. Can you help me out? Uh, they seek help from those that are more skilled. They don't just, um, you know, get down in the dumps. Oh, woe is me about that they're not as good as somebody else. Self-comparison, comparison with other people is poison. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, I've, I'm a little older than some of y'all in here, and I, I'll, I'll tell you that 
uh, from experience, that is a bad thing. It's poison. So don't do it. Okay. Victims blame, whereas creators accept responsibility. That's the one about, uh, remember I told you that the professor gave me an F. Well, no, no. He didn't, or she didn't. I earned an F. We need to own it. Uh, if you go through life blaming other people and other things for the situations that you're in, then you're going to be a sad person and you're not going to be successful. But if you are a creator and you accept the responsibility for your grades, for uh, the outcomes of, of your life, then it'll get better. You will, it will change. Blaming. Dr. Nathaniel Brandon said, blaming is a pastime for losers. I love that. There is no leverage in blaming. Power is rooted in self-responsibility. Blaming is a pastime for losers. Don't be a loser. Another, the victims see problems as permanent, whereas creators treat problems as temporary. Uh, if you said, if you ever said, I'll never be able to understand this, or I'll never uh, get over this problem, whatever it is, then you're seeing your problems as permanent. On the other hand, you should, we should say stuff like, um, you know, I'll read the directions and figure it out better next time, or I'll do better next time. Uh, I will find a solution to this so that this doesn't keep happening. Another is that victims repeat ineffective behaviors, whereas creators do something new. Uh, let's say that you went to the ACE lab one time, or two times, and when you came here, you didn't find any tutors to help you. And so you just fell into the ineffective behavior of, well, I'm not going to the ACE lab, they never have any tutors. What should you do? Eventually, it's going to happen. You're going to find the tutor that you need. Maybe they were just having an off day. Maybe uh, that person who would have tutored you was sick. It's not, uh, it's not a permanent thing. And we don't need to repeat that ineffective behavior. Do something new. Now, this one sounds a little funny. And so I put quotation marks around this word because uh, when we say, you know, we want people to say, I'll try to be better. But... A lot of times when we say that, we're not really trying. It's just, it's just words that we say to get somebody off of our back or to make ourselves feel a little better. So victims try. Creators do. They do it. They may fall and fail, but they get back up and they do again. Victims just try, which is code for I'm not going to do anything. And lastly, victims predict defeat and give up the self-fulfilling prophecy, whereas creators think positive, positively and look for a better choice. So what is a self-fulfilling prophecy? If I say I'm never going to understand algebra, I'm probably never going to understand algebra because I am putting that on myself. I'm, I'm creating myself as a person who will never get algebra. That means I'm not going to try, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to, I'm not going to move positively toward that goal. But if I'm a creator, I'm going to think positively and look for a better choice. The bottom line is this. When you hear ownership of the problem and a plan for action, you know you're talking to a creator. Ownership and an action plan. Do you do that? Do you take ownership of your grades? Or is it somebody else's fault? And do you have a plan for getting that degree? Are you going to do it? Okay. I see some, some uh, resolute nods out there, and I'm glad to see it. That's great. So let's try some together. Let me give you some op uh, opportunity to, to figure out how to be a creator rather than a victim. All right, here's one. Yeah, this is a big one. If they do something about parking on campus, I wouldn't be late so often. Hey, have y'all ever had to park by the nursing building and walk? Okay. All right, so this is a reality. What, what, do you, what do you do then? How do you be a creator instead of being a victim? That's right. Listen, I get here at sometimes 645. I got here this morning at 645. The parking lot was open. I could take any place I want. So some of y'all are, well, you know, some people, I'm not saying y'all, but some people say, I'm not doing that, victim, victim. 
That's what I mean. That's good. I'm serious. Are you going to be a victim or are you going to be a prey? All right, here's another. I mean, if it's important to you, you can walk. That's fine. But just don't complain about it. All right, number two. I'm failing my online class because the site canvas is impossible to navigate. What do you do? You get help. That's right. There's a little thing up at the top of the canvas that says help. There are like six different options. You can chat, you can call, you can email, whatever it is. You can look at the guides. If you don't do those things, it's your fault, right? Number three, I'm too shy to ask questions in class, even when I'm confused. That's victim language. What are you going to do? Any shy Shake people in here? What? Shake it off. Shake it off. Okay. You just kind of and talk to them. You know, that's real. I, I started to put something like that on the screen, but I didn't want to be, you know, man up or woman up. That's really what a lot of this is about. It's about being a grown up. You know, it's not, it's like putting away the childish things and being a grown up. Or you can wait till after class and talk to them one on one. Great. Exactly. Number four, that person's a lousy instructor. That's why I failed the first test. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You got to figure it out. You may fail the first test, but you may not fail the second test, even with a lousy instructor. What about, I hate group projects because people are lazy and I always end up doing most of the work. What do you do? Do the work, right? You can't make somebody do something you're not going to do. That's right. And, and this is the way it is in real life. This is, this is um, the workplace. You're gonna you're gonna have great projects in your workplace. You're gonna have lazy people, and you're just gonna do it. If you want the job to get done, sometimes you just gotta do it, or try to motivate those people to do do some work. Um, we'll do a couple more here. Um, the financial aid form is too complicated to fill out. That's it. Yeah. Ask for help. Yep. How about I didn't I work nights, so I didn't have time to do the assignment. Before you go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I work every night. You know about it. So we'll, we'll send it to you. We'll, we'll, we'll make you uh, fill the man up, right? Okay. That's right. First. <laughs> All right. Good answers. Y'all did great. Okay. Uh, well, any questions? Does anybody have any thoughts or anything to, to, to end our session with? Any words of wisdom? Any ways that you have. Uh, become a creator rather than a victim. Personal experience. Nobody wants to? Physics. Tell me. Tell us. I'm, okay, well, I'm actually not that great at math, but I decided to take a new approach in life. I actually understand it this time, which I do, mm -hmm. and I think I did well on my first test. Okay. Because I look at it in a different perspective. And, and what was that perspective? I'm going to do good in this class. That's it's it. It's basic math. It's easy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying. Yeah. You're. 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 You have a positive attitude. That's great. Who else? Anybody else? Lori, what about work? You work every night. What have you had to do to be a be a grown up? Oh, no. <laughs> well, of course, I give up my sleep every night to go to work. Yeah. So you know, I accept that, and um, I just keep my eye on the prize and and just keep it moving. That's right. You know, and yeah. no matter what you know, what rock is in front of me or what is in front of me, I'll figure out a way to get it out of my way and continue on. That's right. That's why you're here today. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Jock, any words of wisdom from a, an experienced... Uh... <laughs> I think the best thing that I've heard so far is just, you know, man up and no matter what rock is in front of you, you've got to persevere. That's because right. ultimately it's about you it sounds bad to say this, it's not about your family. Right. It's certainly not about your friends. This is your life and what you want to accomplish in life. Good. Good words to end with. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.